As most of you know, this is the SN7, a tank designed for the Starship that imploded today during a pressure test, but not to worry, this was done intentionally. The folks at SpaceX pushed this tank to its very limits until finally it breached. So really, as far as I'm concerned, there's no sense in showing you any explosions or any wrecked wreckage or anything along those lines because you've seen this many times before and you can find it just about anywhere on YouTube. But there's another detail which I found to be a lot more interesting. You see, shortly after the test, sharp-eyed observers at Boca Chica spotted this running around the test site after the explosion. And what is this? Well, aside from the fact that it looks like a robot dog, it's actually an all-terrain visual inspection tool from Boston Dynamics. And Boston Dynamics calls this machine Spot, whereas SpaceX calls it Zeus. Now Zeus is bristling with all kinds of observational equipment, such as pan tilt, zoom cameras, and lidar, all sorts of things, but when it comes right down to it, its main advantage is that it can go where humans cannot, namely in areas where cryogenic fuel is still in the process of escaping, which is what it appeared to do today. As a matter of fact, the robot may have been on site before the breach occurred. If a blast knocks it over, it can get right back up. It's resistant to dust and rain and all kinds of other inclement weather. And hopefully, this particular piece of equipment will be instrumental in making sure that future fuel tests do not go awry. But as we continue to test our latest generation of chemical rockets, I recently came across a proposal for a groundbreaking type of propulsion that uses nuclear fission and can transport us to the red planet in as little as 30 days. And the interesting thing about this is this is not a new concept. It was first proposed in the 1980s. Welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. A whole hell of a lot has happened in the last week or less than a week as I'm recording this. I put out as a, an appeal, as most of you know, to help me make this my full-time career. And since that time, the response has been overwhelming. As of my shooting this particular video, I have nearly 80 Patreon supporters, and I'm hoping that that number goes up by the time the video actually is uploaded. And I am recognizing some of those Patreon supporters right now, as you can see. Thank you so much for taking that leap of faith and helping me out. We also had our first streaming event. Over 2,000 people have tuned in so far to it even though only Patreon supporters were the ones who were asking questions and participating in the discussion. So we had quite an audience. And once again, I am overwhelmed. Thank you so much. And subscribers have been going through the roof as well. But in any event, if you want all of this to continue, then I ask you humbly to please continue to support me on Patreon as I continue to look for other sources of support as well. And as a special thank you, I'm adding additional benefits to being Patreon members, including discounts on Angry Astronaut merchandise. What merchandise, you say? Well, check out the description and you'll find a link to my brand new Twitter account where I'll give you information on that. So I think that just about catches us up. So let's move on to the topic at hand. Or rather, let's talk about what happens to be pissing me off right now. 
because with all of the millions of dollars that are currently being spent on methods to get us to the moon and to Mars by just about everybody, very little is being spent in terms of developing new forms of propulsion. Everything is based on the concept of chemical rockets. Now granted, there's a lot of new technologies being involved in the use of these, and there will always be a place for chemical rockets, at least in the foreseeable future as we explore the solar system. But nevertheless, as far as transporting humans especially, is it not in our interest to pursue alternate forms of propulsion? Forms of propulsion that will get us across the solar system in much shorter spans of time? I mean, six months to Mars is a tremendous amount of time and has a lot of problems involved with it. And it makes access to the rest of the solar system very close to impossible. So isn't this something that we should be more aggressively pursuing? And there are a number of options available to us with our present technology. I've already discussed nuclear thermal, which could get us to Mars in about 100 days or so with current technology. I've discussed the Vasmir project, which has its drawbacks in terms of energy requirements and may require that we crack the problems with fusion before we pursue that. But what if I were to tell you that there's a form of propulsion that uses nuclear fission and technology that we have available to us right now that could get humans from the Earth to Mars in 30 days. Sound impossible? Keep watching. Now, a quick review of what makes nuclear rockets superior to chemical rockets. In the case of nuclear thermal propulsion, what the nuclear reactor does is superheats a particular type of fuel, in most cases hydrogen, and accelerates it out the back of the nozzle at a very high rate of speed. The faster the propellant leaves the nozzle, the less of it you have to use to achieve the same amount of kinetic energy. Therefore, your rocket lasts longer before it runs out of fuel and it is more efficient and can achieve a greater velocity. But instead of heating fuel, why not use the products of the fission reaction itself to provide thrust? That is to say, the ionized products of a fission reaction, which has to be disposed of anyway, and electromagnetically drive it out the nozzle of the rocket at speeds of between 3 to 5% of the speed of light. Now there are a couple of ways to control this process. The first is to arrange the fuel very thinly on a stack of thin carbon disks which are rotated through the reactor core. This creates a highly controlled nuclear reaction and the resulting particles are electromagnetically driven out of the nozzle as I said before while the disks rotate out of the reactor core before they melt and more fuel is then added to the disks. Now of course we're talking about a hell of a lot of heat here, but nevertheless, because the surface area of the disks is much greater than the amount of fuel that is placed on them, that actually provides a lot of natural cooling and therefore not as much heat that needs to be radiated out into space. It's a pretty efficient system, but there is better. The so-called dusty plasma fission fragment nuclear rocket injects nanoparticles of nuclear fuel into a vacuum chamber and controls it with a magnetic field. Since you would inject only a limited amount of dust into the vacuum chamber at a time, there would be a considerable amount of open space between particles, thus increasing their surface area, so to speak, and reducing the heat of the reaction considerably. And then once ionized by the nuclear reaction, once again the particles are driven out the nozzle, or part of the reaction could be used to power the rest of the spaceship. So what does all this mean? Well, chemical rockets burn out in about 450 to 500 seconds, whereas nuclear thermal rockets take about a thousand seconds or so, whereas the fission fragmentary drive would not burn out for half a million to a million seconds. 
Now before you get too excited, keep in mind that the thrust per second would not be nearly as much as you'd have with a conventional rocket, but this could be adjusted for with afterburners that in inject hydrogen fuel into the beam of escaping particles, superheating the hydrogen and providing a lot of additional thrust, at least for a short amount of time. If this sounds familiar, well yes, that's the nuclear thermal system, so this would be sort of a hybrid engine. So what would this ship look like? Well, there's a number of concepts, but they essentially follow the same idea. The engine at the back, a considerable distance from where you keep the crew, a large number of heat radiators in order to dissipate the heat into space, and then the crew module at the front. And if it looks small, don't be deceived, it's actually 60 tons, not too far off from what the Starship would transfer in terms of crew, cargo and passengers. Now, of course, this design differs considerably from that of the Starship. It would be almost impossible to make the Starship use this kind of fuel system without considerable modifications. So am I suggesting that the Starship would may be made obsolete by something like this? Well, no, not at all. Because this ship would be, have to be constructed in space and could only operate in space. On the contrary, the Starship would be absolutely invaluable to a vessel like this. First of all, you'd need something like the Starship's heavy cargo capacity and reusability in order to be able to assemble a vessel like this in orbit in the first place. Secondly, the Starship could easily deliver the 60-ton crew module as well at departure time, and then of course you would also need a Starship at Mars once the vessel arrived in order to transport the crew module down to the Martian surface. Now if all of this sounds like a hell of a lot to go through just to get people to Mars, well, you're kind of right, but also consider that the current plan to get the Starship to Mars involves six orbital refuelings by tanker starships, and I've said this in a couple other episodes. Six refuelings, which is quite complicated in itself and still only delivers a crew to the Red Planet in six months. So when it comes down to it, both systems are pretty complicated, but the fission fragmentary system has one important advantage. Instead of a six month transit time, it's a 30 day transit time, or 60 days round trip. Now the advantages to this system with a 30 day transit time are many fold. 30 days in microgravity, 30 days exposure to cosmic rays, a reduced transit time would also reduce the possibility of major events like a solar storm occurring or a planet-wide dust storm getting kicked up during your journey, which would consume your landing site and make landing almost impossible or at least extremely hazardous. Also, an unmanned version of this ship could haul a considerable amount of cargo, well over a hundred tons. It would reduce its speed, of course, but it could easily make the six-month transit time with a lot more cargo than the Starship would be able to carry. This also opens up the possibility of short duration journeys to Mars. 30 days there, 4 months on the planet's surface, and 30 days back. Such a thing would be absolutely impossible with chemical rockets. This also opens up the realistic possibility of Martian tourism. Six months there, two years on the planetary surface until the planets are aligned properly again and six months back is a hell of a commitment for a tourist, but a few months? That might be something that a lot of tourists would be willing to accept, especially when such magnificent natural wonders unique to the solar system would be waiting for them on the red planet. 
But to me, the most exciting part of this type of propulsion is the fact that it opens up the outer solar system to human exploration, allowing us to reach the Jovian system in as little as 18 months, or specifically the moon Callisto, which is so far out from Jupiter that it can escape its radioactive influence, plus it contains a great deal of water ice on its surface, giving us the potential to establish yet another self-sustaining human presence in the solar system. But this propulsion method, or any nuclear propulsion method, is not without its drawbacks. In fact, it has quite a few of them, not least of which, of course, is the fact that it's nuclear. And nuclear propulsion has a lot of opponents here on Earth. Attitudes would need to change, treaties would need to change, plus the risk of sending large amounts of nuclear material into orbit, probably best accomplished by a rocket that has an abort system. And there is another problem. We're talking about a rocket that essentially expels nuclear waste, and even though studies have shown that that waste, when it hit the atmosphere, would be very little different than the cosmic rays we already get bombarded with, it would still represent a threat to anything in low Earth orbit, and so this sort of ship would probably be best placed in either a geosynchronous orbit, or more preferably, somewhere near the moon. Nevertheless, as our efforts to explore and colonize Mars and elsewhere in the solar system continue, I am convinced that nuclear energy in some way is going to be vital to our success. And I even haven't even talked about nuclear power sources on the surface of Mars, which may prove to be unavoidable considering the nature of planet-wide dust storms and the impact that it has on solar power. So as we excitedly wait for the latest information on the Starship, we should also be excited about the prospect when we leave Mars behind and push even further with technologies that we should be exploring now. Now to be perfectly clear, I am not advocating at all that we switch propulsion methods before we try to put humans on Mars. Such a thing would be impractical, would extend our launch date by a considerable amount and involve a lot of extra engineering to the Starship or whatever type of vessel that we choose to use in the future. But nevertheless, I think it would be foolhardy for us to continue to rely on exclusively on chemical propulsion. Chemical rockets are going to be an important part of interplanetary travel for the foreseeable future, but they should not be an exclusive method. We need to find other solutions, and nuclear propulsion of some kind, either nuclear thermal or what I've put forward in this video here, is a very, very doable alternative and will eliminate a lot of the problems represented by a six-month transit time from here to the red planet. And it will also open up the rest of the solar system to colonization. Because sooner or later, I think it will be in our interest to do that as well. So, until that day comes, I urge the scientific community and those who are working on our interplanetary ambitions to put some more effort into these alternate propulsion methods. And in the meantime, everybody else, stay angry about space.